Good morning. Thanks for being here. Um, for my PhD work, I study the phylogeographic patterns and conservation genetics of a unique group of marine fishes, the sea dragons. Today, I would like to speak to you about sea level changes and their impacts on one of these species, the common sea dragon. So I'm taking you to a marine system now and to the southern hemisphere where we will be focusing on Australia's temperate coast. Australia's southern coastline is a prime example of a coastline that has been changed by Pleistocene glaciations and associated sea level changes. Here we see the current sea level of the temperate coastline and we will now move <coughs> backwards in time and um, sea level will drop um, the following. The purple areas will indicate areas that fell dry when sea levels dropped. So you can see that nearshore organisms, like our sea dragons, probably um, shifted outwards um, quite dramatically. And we are stopping here at about um, 100 meters below the current uh, sea levels. And this is um, the lowest sea level stands to the, during the last glacial maxima, um, 17,000 uh, to 20,000 uh, years ago. Importantly, in the southeastern part of Australia, we see that a land bridge emerged. This Bastion Isthmus caused um, a land bridge <coughs> that facilitated dispersal for terrestrial organisms, but for marine organisms, it posed a phylogeographic barrier that has been described in a variety of marine taxa, ranging from kelp or the barnacles um, to several fishes. Aside from the Bastion Isthmus, very few phylogeographic studies have considered the entire southern range of Australia, um, and this is where our study comes in. The temperate coast of Australia is relatively cold, and it harbors a unique ecosystem of temperate reefs, which are basically hard substrate, um, shallow reefs that are covered by macroalgae, such as kelp, with some inter in interspersed seagrass beds. The temperate coast of Australia um, also harbors some amazing um, animals, like the sea dragons, which are all endemic to this coast. There are three species of sea dragon, the common sea dragon, the leafy sea dragon, and the ruby sea dragon. This last species was only described in 2015 by our group, and it highlights that the southern Australian coast still harbors quite some um, excitement that we have about the common sea dragon and leafy sea dragon show these amazing camouflaging adaptations that allow them to blend in with their macroalgae habitat. And they are hugely popular in the aquaria worldwide. Nonetheless, we know relatively little about them um, scientifically, and there has been no genetic assessment of their phylogeographic structure. Sea dragons are members of the fish groups in Nathidae, and they are all characterized by having these elongate um, snouts, and also by males carrying the brood. So we expect sea dragons to be highly structured across their range in Australia, because a dispersed egg phase is missing, and the juveniles also seem to be uh, lacking a pelagic phase where they um, disperse great distances. Observations uh, tell us that adult sea dragons seem to be staying within very tightly defined home ranges and they seem to be occurring at very low densities. Today we are focusing on the common sea dragon, which has the widest distribution of all sea dragon species, covering the entire temperate coastline. For this study, we sampled uh, tissues from 157 individuals over the past decade. This uh, data set is still growing and we just returned from a field trip to Western Australia. And for each locality um, outlined here by these dots, we sampled between 10 to 15 individuals by taking non-lethal tissue samples. Only in Southern Australia, um, we don't have um, full population level samples here. Um, most of our samples here came from museums, so sampling dots here actually correspond to individuals rather than Because we wanted to resolve relatively fine scale um, patterns and look into the demo demographic history of these species, we decided to um, conduct a next generation sequencing approach. 
we decided to target ultra-conserved elements or UCEs for our study. The probe set was designed by Brand Faircloth, and Brand and Michael Farrow um, have also helped me um, set up our um, project uh, initially several years ago. The probe set was designed to target over 1,300 um, ultra-conserved regions that should be conserved among um, members of Procomore fishes. By using ultra-conserved elements, we can um, only selectively target um, sequences that hold the ultra-conserved element and then the flanking regions. Of the targeted regions, we recovered a high number of these loci in our sea dragons, and each, um, and each UCE locus is composed of the conserved core and then the flanking regions. We try to generate relatively large uh, loci in order to um, increase the possibility of encountering SNPs in these ultra-conserved elements. And on average, we had um, loci of length of 1,600 base pairs, which um, added up to 1.8 million base pairs of sequence information for all of our individuals. After SNP calling and uh, stringent filtering, we recovered that 90% of the UCE loci had at least one uh, SNP associated with them. We were initially a little bit concerned that the ultra-conserved elements may not provide sufficient resolution to look into interspecific patterns, because ultra-conserved elements are by design ultra-conserved, but we saw that um, the frequency of SNPs would increase rapidly when moving away um, from the ultra-conserved core. So we ended up with a matrix of almost 10,000 SNPs um, in all of our individuals, and we had on average nine SNPs per UCE locus. For um, the majority of our analysis, I selected a single SNP per UCE locus to um, account for linkage among these SNPs, but in other cases, we were able to use the full sequence information. This principal component <coughs> analysis shows you a summary of all of our data. The 157 individuals are here represented um, by individual dots, and the closer two dots are to each other, the genetically similar, the more similar they are. In the center of the range, we see clear geographic structuring and clearly distinct groups um, corresponding to geographic areas. If we're moving towards the range edges, um, this pattern is less clear. We see that a lot of individuals are genetically very similar, despite coming from a huge um, geographic span. The same pattern is seen on the western part of the range edge. We also see this in terms of genetic diversity. Here I'm plotting expected heterozygosity on the y-axis and we are plotting um, averages of each population in a range from west <coughs> to east. We see high genetic diversity in the center of the range that then quickly tapers off towards the, um, towards the edges of the range. One explanation for this may be found in the um, oceanographic changes that this area has experienced over since the last glacial maximum. It turns out that especially Eastern Australia has um, been warming considerably since the last glacial maximum. During the last glacial maximum, um, water temperatures were much colder in this area um, compared to the central regions which held a more consistent temperature throughout the cycles. To a lesser extent, um, temperatures were also varying um, along the western coast um, moving north. As expected from other marine organisms, the Bass Strait um, accounted for the majority of the genetic variation we observed in our data set. So here I'm showing a population tree um, estimated from NACE uh, distances, and it shows um, the main split of the data um, being here, separating individuals on the east coast of Australia from all the samples um, west of the Bass Strait. The Bass Strait opened approximately 14,000 years ago, and we see that there is a big split, but can we actually observe um, that there has been um, 
migration between these two distinct population segments um, since the opening of the strait. The first evidence comes from the structure plot I was just showing. We see that the individuals from the eastern um, coast of the range form this distinct uh, purple group shown here, but in a population called Eden, we see small but consistent admixture um, from an orange group. And this orange group is found here in Victoria, um, which is the closest, geographically closest locality um, west to the Bass Strait. We cannot infer the directionality of um, gene flow from the structure plot, so I chose um, to investigate this using tree mix and also a coalescent sampler um, G Fox. Tree mix estimates a population tree from um, allele frequency data of populations, and it recovered the same topology as is shown here. We can then allow for mig migration events um, that allow for reticulation of this population tree. And one of the migration events we inferred was <coughs> from this Port Sea Flinders region into the Eden population. So this was a very strong signal that we consistently recovered. I then also used the coalescent sampler GFOX to look at the, um, the uh, migration patterns in both directions. And we could infer that um, migration west going east is about three times as strong as migration going from the east towards the west. Obviously, this data set still holds a lot of potential for exploration, and we are working on this um, using coalescent simulations and um, demographic models. But in conclusion, we see that glaciations have had a profound impact on the distribution of genetic diversity in common sea dragons. We saw a strong phylogeographic structure in the center of the range versus um, lower genetic diversity around the edges of the range, which may be attributed to oceanographic changes in the species. We saw a strong divergence across the Bass Strait, which is consistent with other um, species, but we also saw evidence for secondary con contact with gene flow um, after the Bass Strait opened 40,000 years ago. I would like to acknowledge our collaborators and funding and many helping hands in museums for supplying um, specimens and I would now like to take um, questions.